closely with uh, product managers, account managers, project managers, and other titles that uh, us techies uh, love to hate. And uh, he's here to share with us his perspective on why closing uh, this gap between R&D and business is essential part of DevOps. So please welcome Shacha. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, hi everyone, and uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Itai, for the introduction. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with uh, this really lousy low-res diagram here, which probably most of you can't read, um, but it's important. It, was, uh, it first appeared in a post by Patrick Dubois uh, six years ago, it was only two months after the first DevOps Days conference in Ghent. Um, and it tries to summarize all those important ideas that surfaced during that conference. Um, I'm going to describe it real quick because it has very mu it's very relevant to what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, okay. So, you can see roughly the three main organizational units you have in, any, in every software company. Uh, on the left, there's the business unit. Um, then there's the R&D unit here. Uh, and last but not least, the operations unit. And this was a, probably the structure of most software companies at the time. And when they had the conference, they tried to think about how you can interconnect between all those units and use DevOps concepts to make uh, operations and business much better. And you can see there's the, the central cluster here of ideas is all those good stuff that we already, most of us already know about, right? So it's uh, closing the interaction between devs and ops. It's about doing deployments, continuous delivery using configuration management tools. Um, it's about infrastructure as code. Um, we've all heard about it more than once in, in, in all the conferences and most articles about DevOps. Um, and what I think is missing from, from the, the discourse uh, are those satellite ideas here, down, down here, and, and here on the top. Uh, those ideas that connect between the business and the, and the ops teams. And just for example, uh, business should focus on both functional and non-functional requirements. Uh, things like operation teams should organize themselves according to business goals. Um, those are the kind of ideas that I rarely see uh, in, in those conferences or in any article, and, and I think are very important. I'm, I'm going to talk about them today. Okay, so a bit of history. So DevOps is really an extension of Agile, right? Uh, the primary goal was to build software faster and better. When I mean faster, I mean shorter release cycles, faster feedback from production, from customers. And when I say better, I mean, um, you know, with this, you know, keeping a high quality standard in the face of, of rapid delivery and, 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 deployment and, and development. And those, those were the, the ideas behind Agile, and DevOps was an ex extension of that, and I'm going to show it in a few slides. So the first slide is, is, is the typical organizational structure, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. Hopefully no one here in the, in, in the audience is still using this methodology, which is called waterfall, right? So you have, business, you, know, you have requirements coming from the business to the product. The product creates all those uh, heavy de descriptions of, of what they want to build, and then they give it to, to the dev to the dev team to implement, the dev team gives that to QA to test, QA uh, signs, uh, uh, approves the, the, the solution and gives it to the ops, who, who, who all they do is deploy and monitor, right? So this is old school. And, and Agile came in and made a small step, but a very significant one, saying, let's take product, dev, and QA and make them collaborate much better with each other. Right? So if you look at methodologies like Scrum, you have uh, cross-functional teams, uh, people from the div different divisions working together. Um, 
um, and, and, and rapid uh, release cycles and, and, and all that uh, nice stuff. But still, the off steam is out of the loop, right? Um, next in line came the lean, which was, again, an, another extension of Agile, the lean style, which said, OK, that's, that's nice to have those guys collaborate together, but we really need to get feedback all the time from production, from our customers. And they said, um, and then you know, release cycles became even shorter. Uh, they, we tried to find different ways to make it, uh, uh, to deploy faster to, to production. And it's only, uh, and, and when DevOps came, they said, hey, we can make, and OK, that, that's uh, awkward, because when I, when I did it at home, it was on my computer, and I wanted to like, show you how it shortens the release cycle. Uh, can't really do it here, but I think it's pretty evident what DevOps did was say, hey, let's make it m much shorter by uh, enhancing collaboration between Dev and Ops. Um, and now uh, deployment, you know, you, most of us, or I hope that many companies do uh, continuous delivery. Um, they use configuration management to rapidly deploy to production, and we get feedback much, much quicker. Um, and it's not surprising that you know, DevOps uh, was mainly focused around how to make Dev and Ops collaborate better, right? Because Dev, Ops, right? It's in the name. But it's not only that. It, it comes from the roots of DevOps. So uh, this is an analysis by John Willis talking about the uh, ancestors of DevOps. And he said things like, and, and you, know, you have Patrick Dubois and Andrew Schaefer who created the Agile Infrastructure Team uh, uh, Forum, uh, which was actually sysadmins who knew how to code. And they say, hey, we can really ship, uh, we can ship code faster if we start to code stuff uh, and if we use our skills better. And at the same time, in Velocity, it was, I think, John Al Alspa who, who came and, and, and uh, gave a lecture about how uh, Flickr deploys more than 10 times a day. And as you can see, both, both of those routes are, are people who came from the operation uh, units. Um, and it was easy for them, I guess, to just trying to close the gap between dev and ops, because those are the kind of, 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 of people, the kind of people they used to work with on a daily basis. Um, and so, that's why I think that for most people, DevOps means uh, how to make developers and IT professionals work as a single unit. Um, and it's okay. It's not, that, it's not a bad concept, uh, but it's simply not enough. For me, DevOps means a set of ideas that help software companies improve the way the business operates. And it's much more than just blurring the distinction between uh, Dev and Ops. Um, because in the end, it's your product units, you know, product management and sales who decide whether the business is successful or not. It's not the ops team, it's not the R&D team, it's those guys across the street, you know, across the hall. Um, and we, when we have miscommunications between business and R&D, we create an inefficiencies. Okay? We deliver stuff that we don't really need to deliver. We monitor stuff that we don't really need to monitor. Um, we get feedback about the wrong things. Um, and, and it's inefficient. So, so I think that what's happening is that we, we're actively dis discussing how we can make collaboration better. This happens all the time, right? I think, I think uh, at the keynote yesterday, he had this diagram on the left, right? How we can try what's the right topology uh, of, of the organization to make dev and, and, and ops work together better. And, and we get that all the time. But we rarely discuss how we can make ops and product and sales collaborate around business goals. Um, and, and that's bad. Um, and I'm going to show just, you know, I'm going to take uh, two areas uh, in operations and give some use cases and some examples of how I think, 
I think things should be, uh, how, how things could be better if we, we try to collaborate. So the fir first area is monitoring. Um, in, in the previous lecture here, it was Ran, I don't know if he's in the audience, uh, it was Ran who said, um, monitoring is not only for ops teams. And, and he, he continued and said, you should enable your developers to, to be able to, to you know, set up their own monitoring and, and send their metrics and whatnot. And, and that's, that's correct. But monitoring is not only for DevOps teams. It's, it's, it's for everyone in the company, and I'm going to show why. So if you look today on, on all the monitoring solutions that we have, uh, this is uh, a poster that Big Panda create. It's actually a website. You can go inside. It's open source. You can add your own monitoring solution if you have one. Um, but this is a poster uh, where you have only 60 solutions that you can pick off the shelf or, or clone from Git, open source, whatever, um, that you can use to, to monitor your system, right? Uh, there are over 60 he only here, and there are over 100 probably uh, out there. And I think that the fact that the, the, there are so many solutions is that you just want to monitor all the things, right? Let's, let's just you know, send everything. Let's, let's monitor applications and servers and network. Uh, let's send uh, you know, thousands of metrics a minute uh, to our uh, uh, key value to our time series databases. And I think that that created uh, this approach for monitoring, which I call the bottom-up approach. Well, you start by monitoring network and servers and applications, and you try to deduce from those metrics what's the overall system health. And the problem with that, or just one of them, I think what the, the, maybe the, the most uh, painful one is alert fatigue. Right? Because, and is there anyone here in the crowd who doesn't have alert fatigue? Raise your hand. Okay. You, 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 come work for me. <laughs> I want to know your magic. Okay, so it's alert fatigue. <laughs> so it's alert fatigue. And why do we have alert fatigue? Because we take tools off the shelf, we install them, we set up, and they choose for us what to measure. Right? You put, you install New Relic, it instruments into your application and starts send, sending like tens of metrics out of the box. Wow, cool. Uh, and then you can create alerts on top of that. And that, that yeah, and you do that, right? Because you can. Um, and the same goes for every other solution. It's not New Relic specifically. So, but what happens is they choose what to, to measure. It's not a conscious choice that we do. Um, so that's the first problem. And and because they choose, is we get fatigued by the wrong information, right? Non-actionable non -actionable alerts. Uh, I don't know, CPU load, kind of things that we all know and, and hate. Um, and I'm just trying to understand, what are we trying to do again? So I think what you're trying to do is to answer this simple question. Is our system in a healthy state, right? That's the main question. It's not about how much CPU we take in, in a specific server or what's the RPM of our application. It's whether it, the system is healthy or not. And for me, a healthy system is a system that continuously generates value for its users under a well-known set of KPIs. Okay? Values and KPIs. Uh, there's no solution out there that can magically know what, what is your KPIs. There's no solution out there that can magically know what kind of value your application generates. It's, it's, it's not there, okay? You're looking at the wrong places. Um, and what I suggest is to reverse the way we think. Uh, we need to do top-down approach. We need to start by thinking about the KPIs. We need to start by thinking about user experience and we need to understand how those affect the overall system health and not the other way around. And if you accept this approach, if you, if you agree with this, with this approach, then I have a question for you. Who in your organization defines KPIs? Is there anyone here in the crowd who defined KPI for his system? 
Maybe one, two. Was it a business KPI? Yeah? yeah? What, what's your job? Product manager. manager, thank you. The only one in the crowd here. It's product who decide what generates value, right? It's not R&D, it's not operations, it's product to decide. If your business is around, for example, real-time analytics, and it takes one day to become, you know, for, for those shiny analytics to, get, to become available for the customer, you're not giving value. And the only one who can tell you, hey, we need to have a latency of less than X, Y, Z, is, is product. It's sales, and we rarely talk about sales, right? That decides what generates revenue. Guys, we're bu building a business here. It needs to generate money. Okay? So, and they decide what generates revenue. They know what generates revenue. Um, not R&D. And it's marketing who decides what generates traction, right? Many, many startups, uh, they, they work around uh, traction. Um, I think that uh, Facebook, yeah, right? That, that huge unicorn, they didn't do a cent before the, before the IPO. Okay, so it was about traction. And it's probably marketing that tells you what generates traction and what not. So, again, when you think about monitoring, you need to ask yourself, are you talking to those guys in your organization or not? And if you're not talking to them, then something is really wrong about how you're working today. I'm going to give a simple example of how a good KPI can do miracles, and I'm, I'm going to take the example of Netflix. And um, Netflix released an article about, you know, the beginning of the year, um, about uh, their search for a single KPI that would really predict if there is a problem with their main business. And Netflix's main business is viewing, right? Um, that's what you do when you go on Netflix. You, you view stuff, you view your favorite a uh, series or whatnot, or, or a good movie. And they discovered that if they start um, monitoring uh, the, the amount of time, like the time, number of times that people click on the play button, and it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter on which device, uh, they, can, uh, they, they can graph it, and they have a very regular pattern on how people play. And it looks something like this. OK? This is SPS. OK, so it's very regular. And if something goes wrong with SPS, um, then something is really wrong with Netflix. OK? That's why at Netflix, they have the concept of SPS uh, impacting or non-impacting. Um, an incident, an outage that's not SPS impacting is less important than SPS impacting by an order of magnitude. And it's amazing. Look at the graph. It's so simple. They're collecting one metric, they graph it, they monitor it, they do an awesome job on monitoring it and finding anomalies. I'm, I'm not trying to, to say it's that simple, but, but everyone can understand this, right? So. For example, this is how an unhealthy SPS pattern looks like. We all understand what's going on here, right? At some point, number of plays goes down below the expected threshold, the expected pattern. That's easy to understand. And this is, I think, what makes uh, SPS so special, right? You have one metric, it predicts everything <laughs> in your system. It predicts whether your system is generating value or not. Um, it's a very clear KPI about user experience, and it's easy to understand across all the company, whether it's product, sales, your CEO, marketing, whoever, obviously R&D and ops, everyone can understand it, and it's amazing. 
So the question is, and I'd like to argue that the only way you can get those KPIs and the only way you can reach that level of, of quality is if you start communicating with those guys that know what those KPIs are. So that's the first example. Now I'm going to talk about a different area, uh, which is capacity planning, right? Um, who doesn't do capacity plan? Who, who, who does capacity planning for, for his system? OK, right. Yeah, many people, right? Most of us here. Um, we also do try to do capacity planning in Big Panda. And what, what I'm going to tell you right now is the true story of, of a feature that we released recently. So I'm going to give a few words about Big Panda. So Big Panda is a, a, we're a SaaS solution. Uh, we aggregate alerts coming from different monitoring systems, and we do smart correlation around those alerts. Uh, more importantly, we're multi-tenant. We're deployed on the cloud, and it's going to be important for the next example, um, because once we develop a feature and we deliver it, it goes to all our customers. Okay, so we, if we open it, if we uh, uh, remove the feature toggle, it goes to everyone. And we recently developed a, a new feature called Big Panda Analytics. Okay, it lets you gain, gain insight into your alerts data, so you can see which alerts are, are more noisy than, than relative to other alerts. Uh, for example, just for example, and up, up until recently it was in beta. So we feature toggled it, uh, we enabled it only for a selected uh, set of customers, and, and we, we got feedback, and, and, and it was very cool. Very cool. And last, but and it's important for the next uh, slide, uh, it's built on top of, of Elasticsearch. I guess that most of you are familiar with, the, with that solution. OK, so what happened two months ago? Two months ago, uh, I have this conversation with marketing product. They're saying, hey, we want to do PR for analytics around the end of September, just you know, a week ago. And I said, OK, makes sense. But we need to run some tests first. Let's talk about KPIs. Um, and two good things happened here. The first one, which might, might sound trivial, but it's not, um, Marketing actually came to us and said, hey, we're going to do a PR about the feature in two months from now, which means we need to GA it, right? It has to be available to everyone. So that's the first thing, good thing that happened here. Um, the second one was that when we came to product and said, hey, we need KPIs, they did two things. They said, OK, let's prioritize it higher and let you work on understanding whether we can uh, we can GA that stuff. And more importantly, they gave us a KPI. Wow, magical. Yes, there was a KPI. We had to be able to do queries in a very short time uh, for a number of concurrent users, for different organizations, of course. Um, so that was the good thing that happened. Um, <laughs> the bad thing that happened is that we did our test, we ran our tests, and query latency was OK, but we had a bit of a problem. So apparently, a high number of shards in Elasticsearch per node compromises health cl uh, cluster health. So just a few words about Elasticsearch. Sharding in Elasticsearch means um, a way of splitting the data across different nodes in the cluster. OK? So depending on, on your index model and, and your object model, uh, uh, the number of shards could vary. Uh, in our case, it was very, very high. Um, and something bad happened here. OK. This was supposed to be a slide of me saying, what? OK. But, uh, ignore that. So, you know, when I heard about this problem, that the, the high, sh high number of shards, I said, OK, I mean, it's, it's tough, but we'll, do, we'll find a way to solve that. And there were many possible solutions to that problem. One solution was to say, OK, let's gradually add 
customers instead of enable, enabling it to all customers. And, and the problem was that once you do a PR, you can't let people sign up and not see the feature, right? So you have, at least all those people who sign up should, should see the new feature. And more than that, the sales organization came and told us, uh, listen, we also need to enable it to around 200 customers. Um, yeah, we can't do 200 customers at this point. So, um, so that wasn't really an option. We couldn't really onboard them gradually. And so we, we went to other solutions. So, OK, let's add more nodes to Elasticsearch, right? More nodes in Elasticsearch, less charts per, per node. Uh, sounds easy, but we're a, you know, we're a startup. Um, nodes, more nodes cost money. They cost uh, complex, complexity. And at this point, it just really didn't make sense to add more nodes. So we said, OK, let's change our index configuration to create less shards. And again, very uh, legitimate, but we had a problem with that, that it would affect SLA. Uh, for example, we could say no one has replication. There's no data replication. In Elasticsearch, the number of shards goes down by the number of, rec you know, divided by the number of replicas you wanted in the first place. So we, we affect SLA. Um, and so the problem was that there was no straightforward technical solution we could use. Uh, we had, there was no other way other than communicating all the issues that all stakeholders have and working with clear numbers and SLA in mind and agreeing on what are the business goals and technical limitations to solve this problem. There was no other way other than collaborating uh, with each other and collaborating with product and sales. Eventually, the solution was to create two tiers of SLA according to the customer's plan. So if you're a paying customer, you get replication and better performance by getting more shards. Um, if you're not, paying, not a paying customer, you're on a trial, then you don't get any replication. And you get only one shard. That's OK. You're probably going to be in the system for 21 days, 30 days, depending on the trial. You're not paying us. So that's a legitimate solution. And the only way we could get to that solution was uh, to have sales agree that this is what they are selling, right? They are not selling for, for uh, when they go to, to customers and they uh, say, OK, now buy, buy our product. And they ask them, what do we get? This is what they're selling. They're selling reliability and performance. Um, and so everyone was very happy because product and marketing got their feature launch on time. Sales didn't have to lose any opportunities. And for us, it meant no midnight pager duties. Um, so everyone was happy. And again, it was only because we cooperated. So when, when I called this presentation, DevOps is dead, long live PanOps, what I was trying to say, it's not only about Dev and Ops. We need to try things differently of, on how we do stuff in our organization. It's about everyone. OK, it's about product, it's about marketing. Uh, your CEO should probably at some, you know, at a certain point should be involved. Um, it's about everyone. So this is me uh, giving you a wake up call. If you are a product guy, you need to provide non-functional requirements. You need to translate business value into clear KPIs. That's part of your job, OK? If you're a sales guy, is there a sales guy here? OK, forget about it. No, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. If you're, no, if, if, you're, if you're working with sales guys, go to them and say, if you're a sales guy, 
You need to understand that they're, only, they're not only selling features, they're selling reliability, they're selling security, um, they're selling disaster recovery, right? Um, and they need to align their business goals with the operational constraints. How many, you know, how many companies here, how many startups sell five nines to their customers? Five nines. You do. You sell it, exactly. It's in the contract. Okay, you're also, you sell it. But, but can you give five nines? Okay, you can't give five nines. If there's someone here who can give five nines, I want to hear about it. I don't believe you. How much is five nines if you take it uh, a week? If you count it uh, by year, it's about five minutes a year. Five minutes a year of downtime. That's not enough time to wake up. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook had more than five minutes, I think, like two weeks ago, right? Google had more than five minutes uh, at various points. No one is giving five nines, and yet sales sell it. Um, and they don't really need to. We're not selling five nines. And if you're in the dev or ops team or whatever you call it, uh, you need to drive collaboration not only internally. You need to insist on working with business goals. It's also your responsibility, okay? Don't expect, you see, there's, there's only one product guy in the house. Um, there's no one from sales here. Don't expect them to understand that they need to, to give you business goals, to give you KPIs. It's your responsibility to go to them and ask for it. And if you're a kick-ass engineer, we're hiring. <laughs> so. You're welcome to come to me uh, afterwards, and, and we'll talk. Thanks, Shachar. Uh, questions? Yeah, questions, questions. No one? Your name is Big Panda, but the panda here is quite small. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one question about uh, the reason for using Elasticsearch. Uh, do you provide, uh, d don't you know the analytical question in advance? So you could do it at night, you know, map reduce, something like that, then you can scale more easily. Yeah. Other than, you know, add more CPUs. Yeah. So, so we had to choose between, um, when we started building the platform, we had to choose between uh, uh, being very restrict about, very limited to the kind of use cases we can answer, uh, and between being very flexible, right? Uh, if, because it was in beta, one of the purposes was to get feedback from the customers, what kind of reports they expect, and to be able to iterate fast over that to, to see, if, see if we could give them something valuable. And that's why we didn't go for the pre-calculated reports, but rather, let's put it all in a silo, and then build aggregation of, on top of that. Uh, but I agree that uh, performance-wise, it was, it, it, if you know your use case, this is a much better approach. Finding someone not from the front line. <laughs> um, so you gave a lot of uh, examples about um, KPIs for production environments and online environments. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you do KPI monitoring or KPI-based monitoring for development environments or. Uh, environments that uh, the KPI in front of the end user is not so easily um, defined or, yeah. I'm not sure I understand that, that last section. Um, then, then answer the first one. Do you, okay. do you, do, uh, do, you do KPIs for um, development environments or staging and not customer facing necessarily? No, we don't. Oh. But why, why should we? Uh, no, my money doesn't come from development or staging. It comes from production. Yeah, so we, we measure our KPIs on, for example, we have staging environments where we measure our KPIs and see if we can, you know, uh, if 
by doing certain changes, we can give a better KPI, but eventually what, what happens in production is, is the real number, right? You can read, there, there's a really good uh, blog post. We actually invested like two months at creating, we use Ansible in-house um, to deploy all our uh, uh, data center. We can, you, we can just you know, create a new data center in 20 minutes in a different region in, in AWS. It's easy. It's one click. Um, and, and we invested two months in creating a performance testing environment uh, in another region to see if we can scale out to, to, to actually you know, handle all those KPIs, all those future KPIs that we're going to give. And you know, it was a great experience. We, did, we wrote a simulator. We, we measured everything. Um, it, it was a kick-ass experience. But you know, it's never going to be like production. You, you're never going to simulate production as well as production simulates production. Uh, there's no way it's going to happen. And worse than that, um, if, you, if you're only going to measure you know, those performance or staging environments and not going to migrate everything you do to production, you're just you know, kidding yourself. So I, you can measure on dev, you can measure on staging, but you need to measure on production, you need to work with that. And what maybe? Can I have a follow-up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. production yeah. You find the KPIs there? Okay. Did anyone? Did everyone hear the question? No. Okay. So we asked whether we measure whether we use KPIs not only for uh, customer-facing application, right, but also for internal uh, applications. So I'm not sure if you're referring to internal you know, application things that are used only by the R&D team or. or in general, so yeah, we have, a, you know, for example, we have our uh, data, data pipeline, which is completely internal. It's not customer facing, but it does affect the user experience of customers. And yeah, we actually started by measuring that because that's more important than whether uh, the front end is, I, it's not more important as important. How did you measure the user experience um, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, guys, but we, I really want to give another, another question, and we're just going to go to lunch, so I encourage you to continue that after. Yeah. Sorry. Howdy. Uh, something you said that resonated was the idea that you're not selling five nines. Uh, right. However, in my case, for example, the customers will ask our salespeople, well, do you offer five nines? And their response is, absolutely, we offer five uh -huh. nines. And I say, um, problem. And they say, never speak to a customer ever again. Thanks. So this ties back to the keynote this morning, but how do you effectively negotiate and communicate that with salespeople to a point where they don't just cut you out of the process? OK. So I. I I, I agree I'm lucky, okay? Um, I have uh, the product, the, our VP product, when he came uh, in yeah, like uh, six months ago, I think it was six months ago, right? Um, he asked me, how fast can we go back, for example, for when there's disaster, okay? Or what kind of, how, what's our availability? And I told him, okay, it's this and that. And it's not five nines. And, and, and he said, OK, let me see. Let me talk with sales. And we, we sold that. We experimented, right? We went to customers, uh, big customers, um, and told them, we're not going to give you five nines. Um, we're going to try to give you, I'm not going to say our SLA here, but we're going to try to give you uh, something, something, something. But, but we commit to that, OK? And, and we're going to refund you if, if we're not going to, uh, to deliver that kind of quality. And they were, yeah, OK. I'm OK with that. And you know, I'm not sure if it will hold uh, for next year when we get much bigger. But at that point, we won't be a startup anymore. 
will be, I hope, the engineering team will be much bigger and we might be able to sell more than what we sell today.